people can get the wrong end of the stick, and generally they have to be disabused of their misunderstandings on a one-to-one -one basis. Now, you are defined by your patients, because when I have to do that more than three times in one day, it gets to the point where I want to kill everyone within about a mile, right? But one of the misunderstandings that I've stumbled across when talking about the opportunities here with teachers is people go, well, Kai, you know, this all sounds fine, but I can't just, well, well I'm just going to go and do a, a randomized control trial in my own classroom. To which the answer is, no, please don't do that, right? Because that doesn't happen in medicine. That doesn't happen anywhere, right? You'd never find a doctor going, oh, I'm just going to do some randomized control trial on my own wild, crazy idea on my own tiny population of patients in a small village in Worcestershire. That doesn't, that doesn't happen. And actually, one of the most sort of depressing and yet enlivening experiences that I've had is, is, is talking to teachers on several occasions where they will describe a research project that they have poured their heart and soul into, pretty much alone, in their classroom, that has taken every weekend and most of their holidays and is methodologically crap, right? And they have drenched sweat into this. And that's really depressing and really unnecessary, right? You can do really good quality research as long as there are people around who can facilitate that. No GP in a million years would do an RCT, but Thousands of GPs sign up and put their name down on something called the Primary Care Research Network. And it's just a list. You put your name down on a list and you say, look, if anyone's running any trials in GP land, then I'm up for participating. And participating means you help to recruit participants. It means maybe you're measuring some of the outcomes or maybe the outcomes are being automatically sucked out of your electronic records in your practice or in your school. And you learn by participating in a bigger process of a good, well-designed study how this stuff works on the ground. And maybe one in 50 of the people who do that will get a real taste for it, and maybe they'll go off and start working more closely with researchers, and then maybe they'll end up designing their own research projects, running them with the help of other teachers in other schools, getting good big numbers so that they can answer questions meaningfully, scandling around, trying to see if they can find good data sets that they could use to examine a question. And all of that requires cooperation, but it requires lists, it requires structures, it requires a research network, it requires a place where you can go as teachers and say, look, if anybody wants to do a trial, I'm up for it. I'm not one of those wild ideologues from the 1980s who think that randomized control trials are the devil's work because Foucault told me or whatever. I don't know. I do know, but I just can't bear to go there. Um, you just say, no, I, I'm up for doing trials. If anybody wants to work with us, we are here to do it. And let's go and do it. Trials, right? Trials aren't the be all and end all. It's not the only way of finding out what works, but they are really, really valuable and they are underdone. Um, and people come up with all kinds of strange, spurious objections to doing randomized control trials. Does anybody here not know what an RCT is? It doesn't matter. I won't. I mean, I might, but I won't. It just... So, you know, an RCT is a really straightforward thing to do. You get a couple of hundred kids or a couple of hundred schools, and you don't know. You've got two interventions. You don't know which one's the best. You randomly assign... Some schools to do one thing, some schools to do another thing. You decide what the outcome that you're interested in is, and you measure it, and you see if there's any difference between the two schools, right? And there's a ton of reasons why that's really useful. The best way to understand it is with this example. Think of it as a blank slate, if you will. Um, okay, so the Education Endowment Foundation, right, you know about them. They're great. And they've been running trials in the UK for a few years. They've now got dozens up and running. If you go at their site and you look through the things that they're doing trials on, it's really, really interesting because very rapidly it all starts to become a little bit more concrete. For example, uh, there's one called uh, Let's Think Secondary Science. And it's really interesting because it's a trial which, at face value, I think, actually that's a little bit of a crap trial. They're not clear about what the study design is yet, but let me talk you through it, right? There's this thing called Let's Think Secondary Science. I have to keep looking back because it's obviously somebody's brand, right? Let's Think Secondary Science. And 
The claim with Let's Think Secondary Science is that they've got this great new whiz-bang way of teaching science in secondary schools, and the very specific claim is that it will improve exam performance for people taking science exams aged 18. Now, that's quite a big claim, because a few changes to what you're doing in your science teaching, in amongst all of the other huge number of things you're doing, I might try and measure an outcome that was a bit closer to the very specific thing I was doing, right? Hoping to have an impact on your overall science grades in that whole year, that's pretty optimistic. But that is the claim being made, and so that is a legitimate thing to do a randomized controlled trial on. Doing a randomized controlled trial on this is a really straightforward thing to do. You find 100, let's say 200 schools who are all thinking, hey, I'm quite up for doing Let's Think Secondary Science, but I've got a lot of different things I could spend my money on. So I'm pretty undecided. I don't care either way. And actually, I think the way that we teach science right now is actually pretty good. So I don't feel like anyone's losing out. I could do it. I don't care if I don't. It'd be interesting to find out. But I don't feel like there's a pressing need. I don't feel like the case is proven for this stuff. So you get 200 schools like that, at the toss of a coin, half of them get Let's Think Secondary Science, and half of them carry on with business as usual. That doesn't mean they get nothing, right? That means they get the really awesome secondary school science teaching that you have been delivering all along. And then, after a year of that, you measure the exam performance and you see if it's changed. Now, the reason why it's worth doing an RCT there is, if we just sit back and go, hey, let's look at the schools who did Let's Think Secondary Science, which is quite expensive and fiddly, I assume. If we just look at the schools that do an expensive, fiddly thing, and we find that they have better school science exam performance, then actually I'm not very impressed, because it seems to me that the kind of schools which choose to do a whiz-bang, new, fabulous science teaching intervention are probably quite likely to be the kind of schools which are going to do better anyway. If I really want to see if there's a difference for the kids who get this intervention and the kids who don't, then I have to randomly assign schools to either get it or not. But I think there's also an interesting kind of second round phenomenon that will come from doing trials like this, which is that I think it will change the quality of claims that people make to teachers. So when you talk to teachers and you hear about the kind of things that people try to flog to them, oh, set up a chess club, it will make your maths GCSEs better. Oh, look at this amazing way of teaching spelling, it will completely transform all of your everything. Now, people can only get away with making very grand claims like that in an environment in which they're not challenged, they're not asked for evidence. People aren't doing good quality studies to find out if their claims are true or not. And by starting, to do that research, and by starting to ask those questions, you change the nature of the claims that people make. By starting to teach teachers about how evidence works, about how do you know what works and what doesn't, you start to change the nature, I think of even of initial teacher training, actually. I mean, if, if, if in one part of the initial teacher training course, people are being taught how to ask for evidence for a claim about what works in teaching, then in another part of the course, somebody says, hey, do this, it works. And the people on that course start going, well, how do you know? Then there are going to be tears before bedtime, right? But they will be good tears. They will be improving tears, because I think that will help to change the way that people think. Ah, oh, right, now, you can't see this. This is a funny slide. This is a slide from a 1950s movie called People Will Talk. Uh, look. You're not trying to do this into um, a vacuum, right? We're, we're, talk we're talking about change and innovation and things that some people will find alarming or threatening. And they will find ways not to do it. They will find excuses. Uh, this won't work. Ah, OK. So these are the different people that you'll meet. Hang on. So you'll meet people who are quite angry, okay? And they'll tell you that all of this stuff 
is, uh, is impossible, right? They will want to shout about something else which is completely legitimate, but which is not the substance of interest to you, right? You will, there will be people who will say, oh, of course, yeah, well, we can't do any of this because teachers don't have time to go out of the classroom and do this stuff, right? And they're, they're really angry and they're right, okay? But your job is to draw them back to finding solutions, or at the very least thinking, well, what could we do if we didn't have those constraints? Or what could we change, you know? People love to bore on about Shanghai and Singapore. They are obviously completely different universes, right? But there are interesting things. Like, for example, the one metric that every parent thinks they know about what works best in a school is class size. And actually, the evidence on class size isn't that great. Shanghai and Singapore, they have class sizes that are much bigger. And the number of hours that each teacher spends with children, with pupils, with students, is much, much lower. It's about 10 hours less per week, which frees up much more time for watching other people teach, for having other people watch you teach, for chatting about it afterwards, for reading about research, for talking about research, for doing research. So that's one example of the way that people can make a kind of trade-off. Uh, the second awful person that you will meet, uh, these people here. This doesn't really work, does it? Um, look, the next group of people who you'll meet who will try and shut you up and shout this down, okay, are people who want to engage you in some kind of dreadful 1980s culture war of qualitative versus quantitative research. Now, I'm not trying to imply that these people are dinosaurs with this <laughs> slide, okay? I'm saying that these people are dinosaurs. They are from a different universe, right? That argument just doesn't happen anywhere except teaching anymore. I work at London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. It's stuffed full of people doing trials and qualitative work on public health interventions, on understanding teenage sexual behavior and the risks and how to modify teenage sexual behavior. And qualitative researchers work alongside quantitative researchers to appraise the outcomes of complex interventions, right? That is normal. That is bread and butter. Qualitative researchers do not stand up in seminars at London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine and say, oh, you can't do a trial on X. They go, oh, well, there might be some problems there, but how about if you did this? Quantitative researchers don't stand up and go, oh, qualitative research is all a waste of time. It's just having a chat, right? Because they've gone through that teaching as well, right? That, the battleground between qualitative and quantitative, it is so mind-bendingly tedious and irrelevant that if anybody tries to engage you in that, just, just walk away, okay? Don't sit with those people at lunch. <laughs> there isn't a lunch. <laughs> uh, so this guy, you can't really see this, but he's, uh, he's, a bit, he's like a knobby kind of guy. Uh, and he's got his thumbs up, and he's sort of pointing at himself, and he's awarding himself a point, okay? because uh, of a conversation he's just had with you. And he's awarding himself a point because um, he has just uh, es espoused, very proudly, he's just espoused one methodological challenge with randomized control trials that he read about once and has now decided that all randomized control trials are completely impossible, right? And that's why he's got this smug look on his face, right? He's really pleased with himself, okay? And you will meet this guy, okay? He might be here, or he might be elsewhere in your world, okay? But these people, again, are, they're pointless bores. They are, they're irrelevant. And, you know, if you meet this person, challenge them to think of an RCT that could be done. Because if you aren't sufficiently familiar with the methodological challenges and pitfalls in doing RCTs, then you are sufficiently familiar. If you're genuinely familiar, then you are sufficiently familiar to work around those, to engage in the kind of everyday creativity that people have to do when they are designing trials. But the worst people that you will come across, the worst people you'll come across, are the people who say that there is nothing to see here, right? The people who say that this has all been fixed. And that, I think, is the worst poison of all. And you are here, I hope, to get together, right? To dodge the energy vampires, this is an inspirational photograph. You can't see it. Ignore it, right? 
This is, a, this is an early aviator getting into a plane, right? Isn't that really amazing? She's going to get in that plane, and she's going to just, oh, it's going to be awesome. <laughs> You're filming this, aren't you? <laughs> Embarrassing. And, you know, that is what today has to be all about. Right? This isn't a fun conference. This isn't, uh, it's, not, it's, not, it's not a show. You're here to identify the people with excitement and vigor and ideas, and you can't sit with them at lunch, but you can go to the loo with them, right, in the breaks, <laughs> in between sessions, and, and, and demand their email addresses in the toilets, okay, <laughs> and ask if you can see them again, right, and build allegiances and networks and go away and plan things that you're going to do and remember that everything you do even if it's a small thing that you go even if you go off and find uh, a good source of, of of summaries that are appropriate to your needs of, uh, of research that's been done from Curie or something and you set up a research discussion club even if that feels like a small thing it is not a small thing you are a pathfinder right that's not a vomity, awful management speak phrase. It's real. You are, you are setting things up, and you're doing things perhaps for the first time. You are finding new ways of working with evidence in your profession. And you can write about that, and you can talk about it, and you can blog about it, and you can enthuse people, and you can start thinking and planning about how to work to make this much bigger. So go forth and fly. Uh, thanks.